I personally have a, a CEO in, in my portfolio who was in Gaza for about four months. And during that time, he signed a six-figure contract with a multinational company. Uh, he flew to a major conference in Las Vegas, you know, went on a plane, got back to Israel, went straight back to the battlefield. Hey everyone, this is Prashant and I'll be your host for the VC10X podcast. And today we have Nicole Priel with us. Nicole is a partner at Ibex Investors and is focused on Israel VC investments. Ibex Investors is a US-based investment firm targeting outsized returns through niche, non-correlated, differentiated strategies. They have offices in Denver, New York, and Israel. In this episode, we talk about Nicole's story and how her mother introduced her to investing at the age of 11. Investment thesis at Ibex Investors, how Israeli founders are showing resilience in times of war, increased focus on mental health of founders, impact of war on business in Israel, her advice for founders building during difficult times, and so much more. So without wasting any time, let's dive straight in. This episode is sponsored by my own podcasting agency called Podcast 10X, where I help VCs start and run their own podcast. While I was running VC 10X, this podcast that you're listening to right now, I asked my VC guests, why don't you start your own podcast? I mean, it's the best form of marketing for VCs. As they say, VC is a people play more than even a capital play. A podcast enables you to put your people at the front, your portfolio founders, your partners and co-investors. It's a great way to build a brand and win competitive deals. It activates all your marketing channels in a single shot be it YouTube or blog post or newsletter or social media, everything gets activated in a single shot. And I get the same response from all the VCs that it's a lot of work and we don't have the time for it. I said, all right, let me handle the work for you from pre-recording, editing, publishing to making social media clips. All you have to do is show up on a call, hit record, do the recording using the well-researched outline we provide you with and you're done. We handle everything else. You know what they said? All right, let's give it a shot. So if you are a VC and want to up your marketing and branding game, I'd love to work with you. And if you're thinking there are too many VC podcasts already, remember there are way more VC firms out there. And if you're not standing out, you're losing out. So if you want to work with me on starting your podcast, go to podcast10x.com and book a call today. I'll add the link in the description and show notes below. Look forward to working with you. Hey, Nicole. So good to have you on the VC10X podcast. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. Thank you. Great to be here. Yeah, it's a pleasure having you on. To start things off, can we have a brief story about yourself and how you got into investing? That's a long story. (laughs) Um, But I, I have to give my mom credit for something. I don't give her a lot of credit in general, but... She introduced me to the world of stocks and investing when I was, I don't know, maybe 10 or 11 years old. Um, She had me watching CNBC on, like on the television in the house. Um, And growing up in New York, I was just exposed to the financial sector from an early age as well. So I started an internship after high school when I was 16 uh, on the New York Mercantile Exchange uh, with commodities traders doing futures and derivatives and things just snowballed from there. So I went on from there to work in a couple other hedge funds and VC firms and financial institutions. Now it's been about 20 years in the field. That's pretty interesting. And what are you doing at Ibex Ventures? So what is Ibex Ventures and what's the mission here? Yeah, so Ibex Investors is a US-based investment firm. Um, It's part VC, part hedge fund. We invest in public companies and private companies in the tech sector, uh, as well as other industries as well. Um, We have a very large focus on Israel as a geography. And in Israel, we look to back companies from pre-seed through pre-IPO, as well as in the public equity space across all sectors. So we're both stage agnostic and sector agnostic. And we make just a handful of investments a year on the venture side of the house in what we think are the most promising companies coming out of Israel. And we really roll up our sleeves and work with those entrepreneurs to help them build what we hope are going to be very sustainable, revolutionary, and market-defining businesses. 
Totally. And uh, IBEX investors recently announced, uh, I guess, $106 million fund. So many congratulations on that. Uh, and can you tell us more about the new fund and what's going to be the focus here? Yeah, sure. So the fund that we just announced is dedicated to early stage Israeli companies in the tech space. And it's essentially going to be a replica of the previous fund, which was also a $100 million vehicle for early stage Israeli companies. We launched that in March 2020. Uh, we made uh, 13 investments out of that fund and enjoyed um, a nice exit. So that was helpful in raising the fund. And we still have a really robust portfolio there. We just raised capital to deploy a fresh set of uh, you know, checks into, into companies that are emerging in Israel now as we speak and over the next coming years. Totally. And uh, we, we are speaking at a time when they, there are uh, different kind of situations in Israel uh, and around Israel, right? So uh, how has the startup ecosystem uh, reacted uh, to what's been happening uh, in Israel recently? And give us a view into that. Yeah, it's a great question. And it's performed much better than I expected. And I think better than most people expected. Um, I think over 2023, we saw Israel in the headlines for some judicial reforms and protests against these proposed judicial reforms. And then on October 7th, we woke up to a terrible tragedy, terrorist attack in southern Israel that claimed the lives of 200 people and over 250 people abducted into Gaza by terrorist groups. So Israel's gone through a lot, but in terms of business and resilience on the ground, we're at a 10 out of 10. Um, you know, by way of example, we just raised the fund. So a lot of investors see the opportunity to invest and deploy capital in times like these. And we see startups continuing to grow and expand their teams and sign deals and get acquired. In fact, I think there were more acquisitions of Israeli companies in the previous six months since October 7th than in the preceding six months, which is absolutely incredible given everything that's going on here. But if you walk through the streets of Tel Aviv or you know, another major city in Israel, you would really have no idea that such a terrible conflict is going on so nearby because Israelis are used to this, I have to say, in, in a very sad way. But you know, we're no stranger to conflict and violence and multiple, you know, terror attack attempts on a regular basis here in Israel. But we know how within a couple of hours to you know, pick things up and get back on the horse and keep going. So everyone is personally distraught. There's a level of grief in the country and, and the level of suffering is you know, unfathomable. But at the same time, we know that the best way to defeat terrorism and to defeat our enemies is to continue to grow and expand and perform and put up good results. So that's what everyone is heads down working on doing, whether they're working in tech companies or industry or investing or any other kind of sector. Yeah, totally. Uh, yeah, this is very unfortunate what's happening. Uh, and I've heard like several stories in a broad spectrum, what's happening uh, in Israel and a lot of stories of resilience as well. Uh, but uh, especially talking about uh, startups and founders. So uh, can, are there any stories on that front on how our founders are dealing with situations like these? Because these are like really heavy on them from a mental health perspective as well, right? Some of them may be called to uh, go to the front and fight a war, right? So any stories on that front? I mean, so many, too many to count. Um, the entrepreneurs who are, have been building companies throughout this all have just been incredible. Many of them have seen key members of their team called up to the army, have been out of communication. Um, they themselves have been called up to the army and put their personal lives on hold while they've gone to defend their country. And at the same time, doing business you know, when, when they can. So I personally have a, a CEO in, in my portfolio who was in Gaza for about four months. And during that time, he signed a six-figure contract with a multinational company. He flew to a major conference in Las Vegas, you know, went on a plane, got back to Israel, went straight back to the battlefield. So they really are testaments to the balance of juggling multiple things at once. And I don't think it, that's very easy. So you mentioned mental health, and that's a subject that we've been pretty vocal about as a firm for several years now, because 
founders are juggling you know multiple challenges it's not just war or conflict it's also you know failure in one regard or another or having to let people go or working hard for something and getting rejected or balancing you know commitments on multiple fronts and that takes a toll so we've held multiple sessions and actually offered free mental health support to all of our portfolio companies in the past and we believe it's essential to helping support you know entrepreneurs because if they themselves are not in a good place physically or mentally then how are they expected to run a company so it's in everyone's best interest obviously to keep them safe and healthy totally and you mentioned how the business uh, has remain, remained as usual if we look at it from the numbers perspective and how startups are performing uh, so uh, are there any opportunities or any silver linings in times li- uh, like these uh, anything that maybe startups can do or maybe new kind of ideas that emerge from uh, difficult times like these mm it's a great question um... Yeah, I think that there are a lot of folks who have become very vocal and mission driven about the cause and they're looking for ways to help and get involved and and get active. So to the extent that that startups can can leverage those relationships and those contacts with folks who want to go the extra mile, now is a great time. Um, I think um there's also a lot of opportunity to look into sectors that might have been a little bit cast aside or you know operated below the radar for the last few years so cyber is not you know stranger to anybody but i think there's more opportunities in cyber security these days i think in defense as well um and you know trends are highly cyclical so if 3 years ago you and i had been talking or 4 years ago uh we would have been discussing about you know working from home and the future of work and managing remote workforces and i think we we've taken those lessons and carried them forward to today workforces continue to be remote and even here you know given the conflict there's been a sustained kind of hybrid sort of work environment and one of the ways that israeli companies have mitigated risk is by having parts of their team located in other areas so we continue to see opportunities both in building companies but also managing companies given new realities totally uh, and israel has a long held this reputation of being the startup nation right uh, what do you think gives it that reputation is it the courage and resilience of the founders or is it something else what is it so you know reputations take years to build and seconds to destroy it's a little bit unfair but Israel has built this brand startup nation over many many years. So it was actually just 10 years ago that Waze was acquired by Google for a billion dollars and that was a watershed moment for the industry here where we realized Israeli companies could be sold for you know significant sums. I think prior to that most transactions were on a much smaller end of the range. So that was 10 years ago and in the subsequent 10 years I mean we've seen multiple unicorns be born in Israel multiple israeli companies ipo and it's just been a tremendous streak so it doesn't happen overnight it doesn't happen in a year it happens over the course of of decades and i mean i think you could even look at checkpoints as kind of the grandfather of the israeli tech industry today they're a publicly traded company worth you know multiple billions of dollars one could look at them and say hey i think you know they were born in 1993 so israel's been building that startup nation brand for for a long while. Um but yes, it's a testament to the innovation and you know the determination to build something. It's innate uh, in in the culture here. And in fact, just today I was sitting with a founder with the most remarkable background innovating in the robotic space. And I joked, I said, "Hey, what a time to be building a company in hardware." And and she laughed and she said, "Yeah, but I just couldn't help myself." and that's that's kind of the israeli approach um, folks folks are thinking about building companies from very very young ages here yeah totally uh and give us an insight into the israeli market uh, broadly uh, what do you think are the most uh, promising sectors there uh, with the prospect of growth uh, in the coming decade yeah so israel is 
is known as Startup Nation, as, as we just discussed, but it really has strengths in multiple different domains. So it is not known for necessarily just automotive or mobility or just semis or just crypto. It really has strength in so many different sectors. I mean, there's just a number of unicorns in Israel just in the consumer space alone. At the same time, you know, we have multiple companies um, in the cybersecurity space that are worth in excess of a billion dollars or more, whether they're privately held or publicly listed. So Israel has strength in, in many different domains. And I think over the coming years and coming decade, we're going to see Israel continue to, to, you know, do really well in enterprise software and enterprise infrastructure and you know, take that as a, a really high level sort of industry classification. Um, but we're seeing Israel also really make inroads in, in AI, uh, which is uh, the talk of today. NVIDIA has a huge R&D center here in Israel, uh, thanks to a couple of acquisitions and otherwise. And I think that that's just going to continue to grow. Um, so I think uh, you got to keep your eye on Israel for any sort of innovation. Yes. Uh, and you mentioned that IBEX Ventures uh, is a stage agnostic firm as well, right? So how do you evaluate a deal that comes to you uh, based on the different stages it's at? Yeah, so we have different team members who focus on different stages. So roughly broken up into kind of an early stage team and a growth team and then public equities. So that's more or less how we allocate uh, potential opportunities internally. Got it. Uh, that's great. And would you like to mention any uh, portfolio companies that are doing exciting work? There's a lot. They're all uh, they're all listed on our website, and you're you're welcome to peruse them and, and and check them all out at your leisure. Totally, totally. I'll make sure to put the link in the show notes below for that. Uh, now let's talk about how does Ibex Ventures uh, add value and help its portfolio company succeed. Yeah, so I think like any early stage firm who's, you know, making just a handful of investments a year and leading rounds and, and working closely from a board level perspective, um, we work hand in hand with our portfolio companies. We often see ourselves as an extension of the founding team uh, to the extent that we, we try to help with things that are high level and strategic all the way down through things that are mundane, like how do I sign up for, you know, director's insurance, or how can I find an office, or, you know, how should I onboard this remote employee? Um, so these are all questions that founders, especially first-timers, have to grapple with, and, and we're happy to be a resource there. So yeah, on, on the commercial side of things, we'll oftentimes try to, t try to help with um, strategy around distribution and pricing, and should we work with channel partners, or should we sell direct? And if we sell direct, should we focus on investing in, in lead gen and digital marketing, or should we hire SDRs and, and take an inside sales motion? So depending on the company, the sector, the industry, the ACVs, the, the advice really varies. Obviously, we'll also help with fundraising and helping our companies get to the next round and setting up a strategy to make sure that fundraising is as short and painless and effective as possible. So the list goes on and on, but I think my, my favorite... Um, kind of response to what is it like being a VC is a, is a tweet that I saw years ago and it said, oh, you want to be a VC? Well, do you also want to be an investment banker, a recruiter, a publicist, a therapist, <laughs> and so on and so forth? Because you have to wear a lot of different hats, but it's, it's really great fun and it's the greatest honor and privilege of my life to be able to meet the most fascinating entrepreneurs every single day and then invest in them and you know, stand alongside them in their journey and help them grow into big companies. It's, it doesn't even feel like work. Yes, totally. And uh, being a VC investor, uh, investor over the years, uh, what do you think has been your biggest learning? Hmm. There's a lot. Um, there's a lot. Let me focus on maybe, maybe one or two if I can. One is that communication, it sounds trite, but communication is so key in terms of a founder-investor relationship, you've really got to be as open and transparent um, and forthcoming with information as possible. And I think that the, the higher the frequency, the stronger the cadence of communication, but even if it's just like little texts and updates here and there, uh, founders can really leverage their investors in the best way possible, not just their investors, but their advisors. So you have a team of 
you know, folks around you. You might not sit in an office with them every day, but to the extent that you can keep them close and in your inner circle and updated, you will stay front and center in their minds. And I think that that's where you want to be located. Um, so communication, you know, don't keep the bad news. Don't keep the good news away. Really share it as it comes. And then like the other tidbit uh, is really relevant to where we are in the cycle. So, you know, we're in a post zero interest rate environment where, you know, post 2021 bubble popping. And I think one of the big takeaways for a lot of investors is knowing when to hold and when to fold. So a lot of investors thought that they could invest in companies and they would only go in one direction forever and ever and ever. And they held those assets uh, at, you know, paper markups that were really substantial, but now they've seen those, those company valuations drop by 50, 70% or more. Um, and maybe they missed opportunities to sell along the way or at the peak. And investors, I, I hope, have come to realize that our job is to make money for our investors, our limited partners. So knowing when to hold on to your investment and knowing when to sell an investment when the time is right is also part of the art of being an investor and, and is one of the main takeaways from the most recent cycle for me. Totally agree on that. And I think that's a very different kind of science or an art uh, when to exit, right? Uh, how, how do you think about that thing? Because when the company is going up and to the right, right, it's very hard to say, okay, I'm going to exit this position, right? So how are you making that call? Because you don't know when the market is going to drop, when the interest rates are going to change, right? So how do you make that decision? No, but our, our job is managing risk. It's taking risk, managing risk, and understanding how much risk we want to have on the table and off the table. So I think, generally speaking, when funds do trim their positions, they do exactly that. They'll trim, they'll sell maybe 30% and hold on to the rest. And if an opportunity comes a few years later, they'll take a little bit more money off the table. And you can either end up looking like a genius or like a complete fool, uh, depending on depending on the, the ultimate outcome and, and the timing of everything. But I think, uh, you know, if you trim along the way and you bring money home to your investors, people are going to be happy overall, even if you left a little bit of money on the table. Ultimately. Right. Totally. And uh, what's the venture activity been like uh, over the past six months in Israel? Uh, has the conflict had any result on uh, how, how many venture dollars are flowing in, uh, maybe from the US? Uh, give us an insight into that. Yeah, so I'm not up to speed on the exact numbers. I think there's data that just came out and I haven't had a chance to look at it. But anecdotally, the market has felt really robust and it has picked up a lot in, in recent weeks and months. Right. So at least in seed and in early stage, there's a lot of activity and there's very, very high quality founders who are going out to the market despite it all, right? There's, in general, there's kind of weak macro environment for tech as an asset class, weak appetite. Um, but you see the really great founders come hell or high water, they're going to they're gonna go out and raise and try to build a company. And I, I think it's a great time to go out and do that. Um, so in general, we're seeing quite a healthy level of activity and very high quality founders building really, really interesting companies. So things haven't changed much in that regard at all. We, we see a lot of activity and there's, there's money to be deployed and there's deals getting done. Right. That's amazing to hear. And what's the portfolio construction strategy uh, you employ at uh, IBEX investors? Uh, in respect of maybe how much reserve you keep aside or uh, what's the ownership targets that you have there? Yeah. Um, so we set aside half the fund for follow-ons, uh, which I think is, is a pretty healthy level. And obviously that's dynamic over time, but that's what we target. Uh, so a lot of people will see, oh, you raise a hundred million dollar fund. That means you're going to, you know, put all a hundred million into new investments. And that's not the case. First, you need to reduce fees out of that. And then what's left after that, you know, cut off 50% and that's what you're deploying into new companies. Um, so that's, you know, that's how we think about uh, reserves. And we think that's, uh, you know, healthy in terms of balancing new investments versus supporting existing portfolio companies. And in the early stages, when we're, we're underwriting new investments, very often we're going to target something in the 15% ownership range plus or minus. Obviously that's going to get diluted over time. So right. really the initial ownership 
that makes a big difference to to cash on cash returns when there's a liquidity event. Right. Uh, totally. Uh, thanks so much for that. And now coming to my last main question before we move on to the rapid fire round. Uh, and this one is about what would be maybe your parting advice to founders uh, who are building in difficult times, difficult in respect to maybe how the market conditions are, investment is not that easy to flow in general, but also of the specific uh, situation that is there in Israel. Yeah, so one piece of advice for founders is go and validate your idea in the market as much as you can. Go out and chat with 60, 70 or more potential customers and have them tear apart your idea and tell them, tell you why it's it's horrible and it's never going to work and they've seen it done before and it's always failed. Um, I think that that's going to help you really refine your idea and your initial kind of messaging and value proposition. So I wouldn't stop that process even as you're continuing to you know, fundraise and, and build out the MVP. It's just so important pre-investment to make sure that you're committing to something that really has legs um, and post-investment to make sure that you're building the right product for what your market wants. So validation is key. I love to see a seed stage slide deck that says that they validated with, you know, 60 or more companies. It shows me that the founder has really done their homework. Right. Totally. That's a great advice right there. Now let's do the rapid fire round wherein I'll ask you five quick questions about the fund that you're investing out of and you have to give five quick answers, right? Okay. So the first one goes, what are the sectors and regions you invest in? Israel stage agnostic and sector agnostic. Great. Uh, and what's the typical check size? Two to $5 million. Great. Where can founders apply for funding in case there's a direct way? Email me, um, npriel at ibexinvestors.com. It's also listed in my LinkedIn profile, Nicole Priel. Awesome. Uh, last one, where can our listeners follow you? On probably LinkedIn is best. Nicole Priel is where I you know, post a lot of my thoughts and ruminations. Sure. Yeah, totally. I'll make sure to put all those links in the show notes below. Thanks so much for coming on the podcast, Nicole. Uh, and I wish you all the best. Thank you for having me. It was a lot of fun. Thank you so much.